Hello from wherever you are, and welcome to Let's Play Games. I'm John McFarland, Adult Services Librarian for National Public Libraries, and I hope you'll join me in learning or rediscovering some of the more common and uncommon games out there. We're back with part two of me talking about poker games. This one, if you've ever seen poker sets, is probably one of the ones you're more familiar with. Community cards, two cards face down, one card burned, one card turned. Except that's not called the turn. That's called the river. I'll get to all of this terminology and explaining why these three clubs in here in the middle could be very interesting. Let's get stuck in. So, last time, we went ahead and did five and seven card stud poker. And this time, we're going to do both Texas Hold'em, which is probably one of the most currently popular versions, and also draw poker, which is slightly different rules. And what I did is, just to show you kind of the progression here, I kept, took the fives out of it. We did, we dealt a lot with ones and fives last time. This time, we're going to start with 25 denomination. So notice how all the fives have been removed, and because of the stacks themselves, they look smaller, but they're technically worth more. So a little bit less impressive, but we'll see just how big the hands can actually get as we go along. Uh, what you may know if you watched last episode was that over here did pretty well. Um, over here stayed away, bad beat over here a couple times, and did okay. So now, what we're going to do is I went over last time how hands work, uh, the suits themselves, how they rank. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and show that to you all over again, and then we will shuffle up, deal, and then I will show you Texas Hold'em. One second. Okay, so with Texas Hold'em, it's going to be kind of development of what we had last time. You're going to get two cards per player, uh, both of these cards will be face down, so that will be the next mystery. But there will be some community cards that everyone gets to play off of. So let me show you what I mean. We're just going to deal randomly here so you can see what's going on. I went ahead and shuffled this a couple times. So each player gets two cards. These two cards will remain face down until the end when you have to prove what you have. And much like when you played with stud, you have to burn a card. And this is after that first little initial round. So there will be a betting round here. We'll burn a card and then I'll show you three cards face up. This is the flop. So these initial cards can be played off of by anybody without looking at the hands, just at all. These three cards, you've got, think to the hand ranks here. There's an ace high. There is a possible straight if you have the subsequent cards that you need. There's not a flush possible here. Probability is pretty low. So then you will have the turn card. You'll burn it and you will turn. There is now a pair on the field. So consider those hand ranks again. If you have a pair of fours, you're sitting pretty right now because you would have a full house by default. If you had a pair of fives, you've got four of a kind, which is the third ranked hand and can beat a full house. The idea of you having a straight is pretty low. Flush is pretty much rolled out. This is part of the game where a community aspect is involved, where everybody has the same knowledge of what's on the field. So you'll do another burn, and then one more card, the river. So here, this didn't really add anything to it. And after all of the various betting rounds with all the knowledge we have, we're then going to do what's called showdown. You are going to show by placing your down cards face up. So let's see what everybody has. They have what we would call two pair, so that eighth rank, nines, over fives. Not bad, right? So let's see what this person has. Can it beat that? 
they cannot. So they have what is still gonna be called one pair, fives, and that's it. So this person is definitely out, so we're still here. They have three of a kind. So instead of two pair, which is that eighth ranked, three of a kind is the seventh ranked. So this person loses out and then they're gonna have a triplet. So this person has to have either a higher three of a kind or anything else like flush or straight flush. What do we got? Eight and a three, nothing. So this person would then win the hand based on the information that they had. This is the community aspect of the game and this is part of the fun mystery of it. So I'm gonna go ahead and shuffle up once again. And in the interest of fairness, I'm gonna give each, we'll take 75 from each, and give it to this player. So that way we've got, you know, they did technically speaking win the hand. Don't wanna be unfair. So we're gonna have the ante be 25. And the way this works in community games like this, um, it actually rotates around to where each person has to give a little bit potentially. So we have what's called the big blind and then the little blind or small blind. So if you are the big blind, we'll have, since they won the hand, it goes in like rotation like this. So we'll say, we'll actually make it 50 for simplicity's sake. So the big blind has to pay in 50. The small blind has to pay in half of that, so 25. They have to play nothing. So these players can decide to just fold outright from the beginning. So they have to then buy into the hand. So there's not the same level of ante that there is in other situations. So now what I'm gonna do is we're gonna shuffle it up here. And then much like I did last time, I'm gonna add some fun mystery to this. And these go pretty quick. Mostly because much like many other card games, you know what you're looking for. So it takes longer from our side because we're having to calculate for four people. If you're playing with friends, the odds are you know what you're looking for from the get-go. So actually for the first one, I'll just keep this one blank. So everybody gets their cards face down. I'm gonna place this here. Let me look, at, look what I got here. Okay, not bad. King and ace. And I don't have to worry like last episode about what's not shown versus what is. All right, so we'll go in order. King ace, so ace high, not a bad card, not a bad deal. This is something you could kind of roll with. I, I would bet into this because if you get a king or a ace on the field, which is pretty likely, you are gonna at least have a pair with a higher card and an opportunity for more. Also, because there is ace king, you have the possibility of a straight, not a flush, don't have any, uh, flush opportunities here yet. Oh, hey, look, there's one of the aces, but you don't know that. So we have ace high with seven and then seven, six. So for seven, six, it's fine. It's a possible straight if you get the cards you need, but because it's kind of in the center, other people are also likely to be joining in that process, but it's, it's workable, it's workable. Uh, and because you have that ace seven big blind, you're willing to at least go along with it. You already had to pay him. Screw it. We'll see. We will see right there. So this person's going to participate. They'll participate. And then this person will uh, put in two. So we've got equity. So I'll just kind of put it more towards the center this time. All right, so 
like we did before, we're gonna burn three cards. Okay, what do we got going here? A 10, two and a four, all of them are off suit. Uh, so we've ruled out a flush. We've ruled out a straight just being freely available. Let me look here. Now we're gonna go in the just single order. This, uh, and actually this will typically be like dealer and the person to the left of the dealer will go first. So we'll have this player go next. Uh, not really a help to anybody. So much like you could in stud poker, you can either fold, you can check, or you can bet or raise. But bet, raise, I'm just gonna keep together. And we've got, either you can do a limit of how much you can raise, or you can do what's called no limit. We're gonna do no limit just because that'll be easier and I can kind of deal with probability a little better. So everybody here, yeah, everybody here will probably check just because you've got the six and seven. You need the five for sure. So five and eight would get you your straight. Uh, five and three would get you your straight, but also kind of increase your risk. You don't know. Let's see here. Oh, hey, there's your five. So, this is now a possible straight. Um, hmm, let's see. Uh, that person's gonna check again. This person, now they really don't have anything aside from Ace High, they'll check again. This person says, you know, I want people to think I have something because they're a three or an eight which, from what you see visibility-wise, is possible. Notice how few cards are getting used here, though, so it's risk is inherent here. This person's gonna call. Some these, we use some of these 25s here. This person needs, you know, significant help, so they'll fold. They don't show it, but that just goes in the center pot here. This person won earlier, so they'll say, you know what, why not? Why not? Let's go for it. So we're gonna see this last card. It is a queen. Well, uh, they needed a three or an eight. Let's look at these burn cards real quick. Well, oh dear. That two of the two of them could have been here, but that's the importance of these. Burn cards here that you never see, by the way. So we don't know that, but it adds a continued level of chance into the game to go further into the deck, uh, especially in larger games where you're using more than one deck pretty often. That adds into the mystery and randomness of this game. So let's see what we got here. Hmm. That person, because of the fold, this person will go next and they're gonna think, okay, what do I have? Uh, they have nothing, they have ace high. So they're gonna check. This person bet before. So I think they're gonna do 75. Since once again, we're no limit. They want you to think they have something, or at least I would. So there's a total of 125 on the field. Let me space this out a little bit and then there's 50 in this center pot already so this person says you know what i'll actually do you one better so they've got they would need to add in a 50 they'll add in 75. so that would be a total of get rid of that 50 100 150 175. So this person would need 50 to achieve that equity and they can decide, nope, I'm good. There's no way I'm winning this hand because they would have to commit a lot in order to win. This person says, you know, why not? So that'd be 50, 100, 50, 75. Okay, cool. We now have that equity. 
and then there's 150 in the pot. So the total we have here is 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 in total in this pot that one person's winning unless there is a tie going on here. So we'll just get this all together since I know it's going one way or the other. So now we will do what's called the showdown. This person reveals that they have six, seven offsuit. They technically don't have anything. This person has a pair of fours. So now over here, all 500 of those chips will head the way of this player. And I will, in the interest of making things a little cleaner, just exchange that out. Usually in uh, games, there's somebody who will have most of the chips all together and will deal with exchanging out as we go along. So I'm gonna once again, increase it up to where 50 is the minimum. Yes, this is adding neat cleaning up easier as well. So let me take a step back because I do want to deal in, pun kind of intended, the history of this game a little bit further. And we're gonna do, once again, Texas Hold'em. I'm once again going to increase the mystery by not showing you these bottom two and you'll be able to see these top two. So give me one second, let me shuffle up and then I'll deal. So last episode, I talked about the development of the game up through the 18th century. Well, now it's time to bring it over to the States, and I have to talk about riverboats. Up the Mississippi and down the Mississippi, we had travel and transport for leisure and goods, which left plenty of time to be cruising on the river. Now, the sort of gambling halls that came with luxury riverboats became pretty expansive for lots of card games. And there are plenty of 19th century accounts, but one, what a title, Exposure of the Arts and Miseries of Gambling. It's from like 1829, and specifically referred to poker itself, which was in more its stud form that we talked about last episode, called it the cheating game. So these games were popularized really on the riverboat travel up and down the Mississippi. Now, why did it develop even further? And why do we associate it with the Wild West? I'm sure you can probably guess where it's going because we are about to head towards the mid 19th century. I wonder what would be going on during that time. We're on that in a second. All right, I went in and exchanged some stuff out. Uh, once again, 100 is the minimum. So actually, let me make this a little easier. We'll put that 100 out and it rotates. So what was the little blind is now the big blind, the big blind moves on. So you have that still buy-in. So the dealer here got 510 off suit. The non-dealer, non-big blind, non-little blind, uh, none of these buttons here, got A6 off suit. And like I said, you don't know what they have and you don't know what they have. We're gonna add in the fun mystery. So uh, the person with little blind gets to act first. They already had to buy in anyway, so they might as well keep on going. 10-5, no reason not to. So they're gonna just plop in 100. And this person has, can't win if you don't play vibes. So everybody's in. So the total pot here is 400. So notice how that entire last hand with all the increases only ended up being a total of 500. We've already exceeded that. That's what upping the ante, the slang phrase really means here. As you play along, typically you'll keep it on that same level for a while, but it will increase as you go along. So now everybody is dealt in. We'll burn a card, a queen, a two, and a nine. So let me. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. 
So this person will decide to check. And this person's gonna put in, remember how I said you could do what you wanted? They'll bet 125, because we're doing no limit. So now everybody gets to make the decision. You have to have 125 just to proceed. Now I'll say, you know what, sure. Why not? Let's say, we'll say everybody decides to play. Even though that means this is already a larger hand. This will also help clear out these 25s. So now each pile is gonna be 225. So we'll do that just for stackability. Once again, you don't know what these two have. Not great hands here. So someone's likely to fold when they realize that there's, unless they get a pair of tents, not bad. So now let's see, what do we got here? Okay. This person's gonna check. This person will check. It is tempting. There's something here that's a high probability. Well, sorry, low probability of a high hand. How about that? We'll, we'll say it like that. And I'll put in 75. This person now has a pair, so they have something. So they'll go in for it. Uh, this person definitely has nothing, so they'll bow out. And yes. Yeah, they'll, they'll stay in. So now the hands are 300 in total. We'll burn a card. All right, so this person here, and this is where the strategy comes into play. Because if you bet and then all of a sudden you check, so it, this is part of the interesting strategy. So they'll put down, let's say they'll put down 100. They want you to think they have something. We now know that you have three of a kind. Pretty good hand, there's that seventh rank. So here's then the question. Does this person have jack and king for a straight? There's not a flush here. Uh, they have to have the other 10 and a nine for a full house. They can't have a four of a kind. They can't have a straight flush more than, no, they can't have a straight flush. So you have a pretty decent likelihood that unless there's a straight going on here, the flush has been ruled out because they can't have three clubs. So I was like, no, actually, I'm about that action. Uh, this person's stuff is in the center. Now, what do we got here? Knowing what they know, they'll go in. So now everyone will show down. This person has a king high. If they had had the jack and if that had been jack or ace, would have been pretty good. So this person will show out and they've got three of a kind. This person has a pair of sixes. So if either of these cards had been a six, they would have had a full house, a pretty good hand. Now, what would have been interesting would have been had there been another 10 on the field, because this person would have bet thinking they had a full house and then lost because this person would have had the other 10. This is what I mean when I talk about the probability of hands. If there had been a full house in play, the odds of you actually winning are pretty good. Um, a full house is like 2.5% of hands. A uh, straight is, I believe, like 3%. So it, you've got a pretty good probability that if you have at least two pair, you still have kind of in the top 
or so of hands. Out of 133 million possible combinations of the seven card dispersion, it's not bad. So at this point, because of that triplet, this person wins everything. So that is, let's, let's do a little count, shall we? That's 500, 600, 700, 800, 900, 1,000, 1,100, 1,200, 1,300, 1,400, and 25. Now, in the interest of making it a little easier, I'm gonna just go ahead and make a change here. So that'll be a thousand and 400, and they'll keep that 25. But then, and yes, I know there are already 400s out here, but in the interest of collecting everything, and if you were playing as a part of a group, usually this would be where this all would start matching up. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna clean this up and then now that we've kind of gone through the idea of mystery cards and community cards, I'm going to show you one other way to play that you can have the whole in your hand at the same time. No community cards, but you've got options. One second. from river boats to the American West as we get into the mid 19th century. Originally Pharaoh, which I've talked about previously in banking games, as well as the game of Monty, were the top games. But that game had limitations. Why? Well, with Pharaoh, you could win or lose fairly quickly, but it was entirely up to chance. It was entirely up to the cards. Well, being able to bluff your way into better wins or really any at all seemed to have some appeal to the people who actually moved out to the American West in the mid-19th century. Uh, especially into the American Civil War, we saw lots of leisure time in between these great battles. Because of that, these games really had the time-consuming appeal and the market, as it were, for trading and gambling really took off around this time and became widely associated even after the end of the Civil War and after the end of Migrations West. All right, so now I'm gonna do what's called draw poker. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and give all players all five cards. And then there will be no community element. There will just be the mystery of how many cards you need. So this will be one, two, three, four, and five. And notice that I'm doing this time instead of small blinds. We're gonna do antes. And this will be 200 just to participate. And these ones go pretty fast simply because, again, you know what you have. So I'm gonna not show you, again, these two. Okay, and the same hand ranks apply here. So you've got here, at least a pair. And uh, pretty close to nothing. So this is another game of 
random chance. And from here, it's pretty fast paced because it's a round of betting. It's discard cards and receive new ones. And then another round of betting and then showdown. So we're really drastically reducing how long this takes. But same hand ranks apply. So you at least have a pair going on here. You have got a possible straight here or a possible flush, but you would need to get really lucky. Again, luck is a huge element here. So everybody has anteed in. I don't even know what this person's gonna do. They'll do, they'll discard two. So we got those. So now you've got choices. So you, you wanna keep the pair. You have to at least have something. I would say get rid of the low card here because if you get another king and another ace, so all these are going into the, the garbage. So you're gonna ask for one card. So this person gets two, this person gets one. We'll get to the rest in a moment. Once again, not really anything. You could try and go for a straight. That's about the best play here because you could get rid of this one card, but you would need a three to have anything. I would say that's probably the best, the hope is you can get a three. So they'll discard this. They'll get this one card. Hmm. I'll discard this one and they'll get one. Okay, so let's see what I get. Remember, you need five cards in total, so this will be what you have. Let's see what this person got. Five, no help. Ace, no help. Let's see what this person got. All right, now we go to this round of betting. So, I'm gonna put in Do 200. They'll put in 200. Why not? You with your pair of queens, it's a pair. Remember, because this is such a random chance game, you have hope, but you at least have something. You have better than high card. Um, this game is a pretty decent probability of having at least something. Hmm, they'll call. They at least have something. So there we go. Uh, this person will decide to fold. They're not even gonna try and bluff because there's absolutely nothing they could win off in the moment that they're called on it, they're it. So there's 200 out the window. This person will raise a hundred. So they've met, and now you need to put in another hundred for equity. They're done. They're gonna fold. Pair of queens now. <sighs> you can only re-raise so many times, just for the record. It's not like you can try and consistently out-bluff the other, but uh, you're gonna go ahead and call. You got a pair of queens. Decent, decent odds. Because remember, we're going off of pair and even then the rankings of pairs. So if you, they'd have to have a pair of kings. You have a king in your hand. Pair of aces, you have a pair of aces in your hand. You have the king of hearts. So it's pretty unlikely they have any sort of royal flush. They could have a straight, but that's a pretty low probability hand. They could have three of a kind, another low probability hand. They could have two pair, another low probability hand. So a pair of queens is not terribly bad. So what do they have here? 
a pair of nines. It is at this point that this player will win this entire collection. Notice how this game goes pretty fast. And I will tell you that uh, the card that was discarded was a 10 because at that point, there was the hope of maybe getting another jack or a king. In theory, I could have discarded a nine and hoped for a queen, but that was not to be. So from here, we'll go and do a bit more change out and then I'll deal again and then we'll be good to go for another hand and I'll increase the stakes even further. One second. Just to recap real quick, this was everything that was won in that one last hand, which translated to, and I went and changed it out, 1,600 chips. And notice how the stakes increase, but the uh, denomination pieces get larger, and it looks like you got less. But as the ante increases in most games, notice that the ones are completely gone now. The fives are technically the smallest denomination, even though that we're not using them. But I went ahead and just wanted to show how, as the stakes increase, the uh, stacks can start to look a little imposing, especially in your playing what we would jokingly refer to as higher limit games with these pieces. All of a sudden, this small stack becomes decent. So I'll go ahead and give them all of their pieces. And once again, went ahead and dealt. Let's show what each of these has. So we've got ace, a nine, a two, a four, and a five. And I'm making the ante this time 300, just so we can have one really big size pot. So that's 200, uh, 300, three, and then that's one, and then two. All right, so everybody's in. Not really anything going on there. Oh, that's not a pretty good draw. Uh, this one's a little better. Here's where you have some decision making. A two, a three, a six, a 10, and a 10. But notice four of your five cards are clubs. You gotta go for the flush. It's one card and it's the risk, but guess what? You've got a chance. So we've got an... All right, let's see. What's this person gonna do? And remember, there's a maximum of three, so they're gonna get three here. They're taking none. Absolutely taking none. Um, let's see here. <sighs> Ooh. Three cards. It may be worth it to go for the flush, but what do you even get rid of? A two, a four, and a five? You don't really have anything. You've got that ace high, and that's about it. I think they're going to go for three, see what their luck is. This person's absolutely getting the one card. They're hoping, begging for a club. Because that would be a flush and instantly goes to a fifth tier hand. That's pretty good. It's worth a shot. Might as well, especially since we're playing at this level. So let's see. Uh, that person's deal last time, so this person's dealer, so this person lacks. So let's see what they got. A pair of sixes. Oh, it was worth it to try because pretty low probability hand, but if you get it, you are more than likely winning the hand. So they've got a pair of sixes. Well, now they've got to commit to the bit. They at least have a pair. It's a relatively low pair, but they're gonna do, I'll do 200, I'll do 300. They'll kind of meet that ante. All right, let's see what this person has. Hmm. Yep. 
they're gonna fold. I'll put this over here so I can show you what was what was there later. They are re-raising. Six hundred. I'm betting you're wanting to know what that one is. Uh, here's that uh, club that you were looking for earlier. Uh, nothing. Absolutely nothing. So now you gotta decide. This person didn't take any cards. And it's pretty smart to assume that they're not bluffing. Especially since they immediately were raised, didn't think about it. Uh, some of this game is all about knowing, especially if you're playing with your friends, if you know your friends can't bluff and they can't really lie that well, well, you know they probably have something. Uh, so part of this is also watching this community element of, well, have they done this a lot? Sometimes I know a friend that I play with who will absolutely just bet on everything. And you never know when they're actually bluffing, but they're gonna go ahead and fold. There's nothing worth it here. It's only losing out on 300. This person says, eh, why not? I'll, I'll go in. And they're actually, they've got something, so. They will put in, just for the sake of this game, they'll put in another 400. So a total of a thousand for the bet. They're trying to fluke this person out. This person's already out, so they're gonna say, you know what? Sure. Let me see what you got. Not bad, right? Let's see. Make sure I've got equity here. So that's a thousand. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. What do we got here? Two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. I need 300 more, which they're happily going to do. And this is where you see how big of a hand this is. So let me go ahead and change it out just so you can see how intense hands can get as you play later on. So let's see. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's 1,000. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten. 2,000, 3,000, that's one five. So this is 3,800 right here. Just go ahead and scooch these away. As you can tell, I'm basically out of room here. And now you get to wonder, what did I have? And it's awesome when you get this straight off of the draw. A pair of twos and a triplet of threes. Even if you had drawn the club that you needed to make that flush, you still lose out, even though it would have been a great hand to have. Full house, threes of twos is more than enough to take this entire pot. This is why games of chance like this can have air quotes, high payoffs, but this is why it's always recommended to just play it as a casual game among friends where you can laugh about this rather than being upset about it. But this is, as a general family, the games of poker. I have to talk about the big elephant in the room that is Las Vegas and any gambling city like Atlantic City or there's plenty all around the United States, but I'm gonna talk about Vegas specifically. Why does this game have the popular hold it does now? Because it used to be kind of a middle of popularity kind of game compared to 
dice games or slots or many of the other ways that you could play games in Vegas? Well, it's all thanks to a certain sporting network which needed to fill their time and coverage. And in the early 2000s, we started seeing televised coverage of this poker game. It was relatively easy to see the table. It was relatively easy to get emotional moments and drama. And it really took off. Also, the internet. It's always the internet that helps popularize some of these games because you could connect basically relatively securely the notion of private hands. You could connect the notion of quickly and easily making calculations, and you could go through these hands on a relatively timed way fairly quickly. So the ease of connection, the ease of use, made this game in particular quite easy to spread and become easily learned, especially when it's being broadcast on cable, for weeks out of the year. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks for tuning in. Be sure to join us next time as we get into yet another set of games. Also be sure to check out our YouTube page with a playlist of all past Let's Play episodes as well as other great NPL Universe content. I'll see you next time.